Hi, welcome. Jamie, really nice to see you. Thanks for joining us on this podcast. As I've mentioned to you before, we're doing this mini series about co-working right now. And I've done my bit. I've done my solo bits about some of our experiences, which are not huge, limited. Um, so I need to reach out to an industry expert. Now, with somebody with 200 podcast episodes plus on co-working, mm -hmm. I think you kind of know what you're doing. So Jamie, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Jerry, thank you for having me. And you are being humble because running seven of your own locations and understanding the real estate side, you are well ahead of most. So it's an honor to join you. And yes, I have super niched into the co-working space or co-working sort of niche industry. I ran two spaces of my own, but I think sort of the unique piece about my perspective is um, I got passionate really early on about helping people avoid mistakes that I made. I'm sure you made a lot of them too, right? Still doing so. Yeah. And it's, but the advantage you have is, is the, you know, sort of financial model side. It's pretty traumatizing when you make mistakes and you've signed a lease and you're, yeah. you know, into your lease and things aren't working how you thought and you need to make changes and you didn't plan, you know, you didn't budget for that. And so on paper, I always thought on paper, I look like the kind of person who should start a business and it should go well without a lot of, you know, pressure. Sort of pitfalls. <laughs> yeah, I have an MBA. I'm good with spreadsheets, you know, done a lot of sort of marketing and brand management. And I was, you know, operations person. And and yet I just made a million mistakes when I started my co-working business. And it was brand new back then. I mean, you started even earlier. I, you know, I was sort of early. You were very early. Well, you, and you ran it for eight years though, didn't you? I did eight run years. for eight years. Yeah. And so I started the podcast in maybe 2016 and I wasn't super consistent early on, but I was like, you know, there's not a lot of resources out there for folks who are trying to start a space and avoid yeah. all these mistakes. Like not everyone should make the same mistakes. We should at least stop making the same mistakes. We can all make new mistakes. Um, anyway, so I ran a couple of spaces, one in Chicago and one in Palo Alto, um, for a total of eight years combined. I had them both almost, you know, for the same, same period. I actually sold the Chicago space after moving to the Bay area. And then I started this podcast and just getting really involved with other operators. So I think the reason I haven't run out of coworking content yet is <laughs> that, I spent a lot of time looking at other businesses. And then you you reminded me that we met um, the first year I was running the Global Workspace Association. So while running co-working spaces, I was also running the Industry Association, which also gave me this macro view, yeah. you know, what was happening. And you know, you've been in it. It's been such an interesting, you know, eight to, you know, eight or so years and things certainly got extra interesting last year. So here for we sure, are. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, it that's the great thing about working with other or, or being on the outside or on the wall watching other operators. You can learn so much, can't you? And yes, doing your own product, there's nothing like doing your own development, but actually working with others and seeing yeah. some of the things they're doing and reflecting on what you've been doing, particularly if you're still in it as well. And it's such a great learning. And you have to try and remember it all. You know, sometimes you forget some of the stuff you learn, don't you? But eight years of running your own space. And were those two spaces close together or how far apart were they? No, I think that was the other thing that sort of made my experience in unique is I was out of pure just life circumstances, not strategic planning. I had a space in Chicago, which is where I started. And I lived there for a long time, 15 years. And then, you know, I'd started a local business as co-working is. And I said to my husband, I said, okay, so I'm doing this thing. It's like a local thing. So we're here, right? We're staying. <laughs> it's like, we're in. And then less than a year in, he's like, so I got this really good job opportunity on the <laughs> coast. And long story short, we agreed to move. And speaking of conferences, I happened to meet at a conference, two guys who lived in Palo Alto and ran more executive suite style spaces and they wanted to understand co-working and they had a space so yeah. <laughs> we immediately dove into doing this space so we were you know kind of financial partners i ran the space they were located upstairs and i was downstairs running the co-working space which to be clear because i think the terminology can be confusing especially for folks who are listening to your show who are new I think when you and I say co-working, we mean flex and within flex, that may mean offices, 
hot desks, yeah. dedicated desks, meeting rooms. So um, my space in Palo Alto was a stronger mix on offices um, and had flex and dedicated as well. Yeah. So, I mean, WeWork's got a lot to answer for, right? And and it's really branded co-working. Everybody's talking yeah. about, was talking about it as a, as a tech company or at least as a co-working company. And actually it's not co-working at all. It was just a small piece. If you're talking 100%. about the purest a point of view of co-working. Um, yeah. But in, but I mean, we could have a whole podcast talking about two completely independent buildings there that you're talking about. Yeah, I think, so I would just say a couple of quick things. One, you know, the big learning there, and you talked about this from a real estate investing perspective, is you really need to know a market when you're going into it, right? You need to understand who you're serving, how they're going to use space, what do they, you know, do for work, what are they... What do they need the space for yeah. um, in order to create the right product mix and, you know, build the right community. And so I made a lot of assumptions, go, you know, I had my Chicago space. I understood it. I had that kind of, and, but then Palo Alto was totally different, right? Palo Alto is for folks who don't know um, Silicon Valley, that's where Facebook is and Google and not exactly, but very, you know, close by. And so very startup, um, focus driven, you know, you talked about tech startups kind of growing. I didn't have anything big enough for them to grow into, yeah. just totally missed the boat on that. So the two different locations was like a painful lesson and the space, it worked out fine. It was easy to fill because of the location. And, you know, but I realized like there were opportunities that I had that I couldn't capitalize on yeah. because I hadn't, yeah, the space wasn't big enough and I didn't have big enough spaces. So I think that was a big learning. I wouldn't recommend folks to just dive into an entirely new market that they don't know um, without doing a lot of due diligence around you know, who the end user is. I teach, so I run a program called the Startup School, Coworking Startup School, and our first module right, is who do you serve? And getting really, really clear on that, not, not just you know, one human, but like, what does your community look like? What are, are they startups? Are they remote workers? And everybody will have a little bit of a mix, but you kind of have to pick like, who are you focused on, right? And build your model around that. Are they office people? Are they, you know, right, yeah. dedicated desk people? Are they meeting people? And um, do they want fancy, co will you guys, tea you, I was, was listening to your podcast and you were talking about the like the tea break station. And I was like, oh, right. We <laughs> tea point, yeah. tea point, that's right, the tea point. Um, <laughs> Right, like what level of service you talked about kind of, sorry, for folks who are listening, Jerry and I just did an, an interview and you had mentioned, you know, amenitizing space and, you know, some of the things you're interested in adding to your ecosystems. You have to have the right user who appreciates that and will yeah. pay for it, right? So it's just, you know, you got to know the customer. And that was one of the painful lessons that I learned. Or, yeah, painful, but just, you know, that took some like working out in terms of being in two totally different markets. And then I think operationally, you realize there's almost no economies of scale to having <laughs> locations and, yes. you know, nobody knows the brand, you know, equity doesn't translate the website, not, you know, the it marketing, different, everything, yeah. It's everything's different. And then, you know, yeah, you're still managing two buildings and two team members and, and that kind of thing. So, and th those what are important you... things to know about. I think this model is you have, I don't know how, you know, sort of close together your locations are, but there's certainly advantage to building a little bit of scale and in, in a market before tackling other yeah. markets. Yeah, so we, we all ours are within about an hour of each yeah. other. And we do get opportunities to take on buildings in other locations. And generally, I want to make sure they're within a reasonable distance so our team can get there. Yeah. I have to say, I mean, occasionally I'll come across a building and you do get tempted, but I just it's one of those rules. It's just, well... There's plenty of these opportunities out there. Let's just make sure they're manageable. I'll tell you what actually happened was way back at the start, Jamie, I, the first project, I didn't actually tell you this, the first project we ever did was we developed a house, but it was at least eight hours away from where we live. And it was on an island. Okay. So I had to fly or get a boat <laughs> I see there. the temptation. We're buying so a house. Definitely a remote. on an island. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There was definitely, yeah, not that kind of island, unfortunately, just a Scottish one. But anyway, it was... Um, it, it was one of these situations where the opportunity looked good, but I didn't really think too much about the long term or the exit and all that sort right. of stuff. And I did end up getting out of and I did end up getting out without losing any money. But it taught me a lot 
about you know location, finding diamonds in your own backyard, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I and I just like to ask you. I mean, there's quite a lot of operators in the US, and some of them are very parochial and concentrate in one area. But there's some that go for oh, we've got a place on the east coast, we've got somewhere on the west coast, we've got somewhere in the middle. What what's your thoughts about that? Do you think sometimes that there's sometimes a bit of an ego behind that, or do you think there are some really good economic reasons for doing that? I mean, if you've got thousands of locations, maybe, but if you've got twelve. What's your thoughts on that? I think if, right, if you have 12, you want to be concentrating on a, a local market. And we see really great brands who are doing well, you know, make that decision. 100%, I suspect there's a little bit of an ego thing or a model that insists that you have a certain type of real estate. Like if you operate in CBDs, you know, just yes. business districts, yeah. which we you know, it's unfortunate probably at this point in time, if, if that's your, if those are your yeah. only locations. Although there are markets here in Canada, we see that, you know, coming back. But um, in most markets, to your point, you can saturate, you know, a, a radius for a long time before you need to go to another market. Yeah. But I think it gets tempting for folks when you have multiple spaces to start thinking of yourself as a, like a national operator instead of a local operator. Yeah. But it's important to know, I mean, 80% of the market is independent operators, roughly, maybe it's 75, but like the WeWorks, you know, Industrious, it, there's a um, brand here called Premier that has 90 locations. Um, certain type of building, you know, which is maybe more of a class A building. And this is how many square feet we take. And this is the build out. We localize it a little bit, but they can really, you know, and they're not, you know, your model is, is by real estate that has improvement opportunities. And yeah. it's a little more of a bespoke, you know, every, every, every location is a little bit bespoke. I think the national folks, they probably spend less time getting to know a market and they also are probably uh, much heavier on office space, right? Because office space is a product that sells yeah. everywhere. You know, we, we probably won't have time to go into this next time you're on my podcast. I'd love to talk. I talk a lot on my podcast about, you know, the fact that selling office space is very different from selling open space Yeah, to, to some extent, right? That user has a different level of, of need and how they want to use the space. I think it's simpler to sell short-term, you know, smaller offices, harder yeah. to sell flex desk. Yeah, but it's great to have both because you can cross sell, mm -hmm. can't you, in, in the yeah, same you, building. I think you talked about this in one of your episodes that, you know, from an aesthetic sort of experience perspective, you don't want all, all offices. I might be yeah. wrongly attributing that to you, but I think, you know, to, today's- I'd agree with it though. It sounds, yeah. it sounds like the sort of thing I'd say. <laughs> 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 um, I got to ask you. Um, you know, we've both been around this industry for a while. You've concentrated on it far more and had much wider um, viewpoint of it. But when it started out, we had kind of these two different entities, two beasts going at it: these co-working upstarts and the more traditional serviced office or executive center market. And they've kind of had their wee fights and fisty cuffs, and then there's those that have developed both together. And what, putting aside COVID, because I mean, obviously it's having an impact, but ultimately it too shall pass. What What are you seeing that successful operators are doing now that perhaps is different from what was happening before? Because I think originally the model for co-workers generally was, you know, we'll have about 30% of our income from meeting rooms, 30% of our room, our income, sorry, from, from memberships, and maybe another 30% from events. This whole space is going to be an interchangeable space, and that's kind of the breakup. I may be wrong with that, but that seemed to be my 
what I picked up a few years ago. But what are operators doing now that uh, is working really well? Has that changed? I think, yeah, I would comment really quickly on that sort of revenue split. Yeah. That is very dependent on location. So lot, lots of operators, I mean, traditionally, if you were in a sub suburban location, were you getting a lot of meeting room revenue? Maybe, maybe not, right? Really dependent. How much yeah. parking do you have? How easy yeah. are you to access? I often tell folks to not model meeting room into their pro forma until they know they're going to get it because yeah. you don't know. A 10% might be safe. And then the events, I think the sort of, if we want to put in quotes, like the co-working operator who we might say sort of stereotypically passionate about community and would be an event host, but even that is a unique operator who, who wants yes. to do workspace and events, right? Because running an event business or yeah, you know, sure. even programming that, like you, yeah. I would guess maybe there's somebody on your team who does that, you don't want to do it, right? Yeah. So, so it would be an operator that has some scale and can have a team member do it because it's typically not, right, the owner operator who's yes. going to do it. Even a community manager and, you, you know, I don't know what the makeup of your team is, but if you have a community manager who's busy running a space, they often don't have even time. They can't make 30% you know, of the yeah. revenue on events. So I would say sort of the commingled model today is really probably 70% sort of private space, like offices, you know, maybe yeah. meeting room would be included in that. And third, in terms of a product mix and 30%, you know, flex dedicated desk. Most folks will have the majority of their revenue coming from office, private office space, yep. right? That's like your anchor revenue. And then mail, I don't think I saw that on your website. And so- No, we, we used to do that. We okay. used to do that, but there's, um, because of money laundering rules oh you, here, yeah? Oh boy. We, we uh, there's another whole podcast episode there, right? We, we got, um, we had a visit we registered, paid all the money you have to pay, which is not insignificant, to be able to actually offer virtual offices. Okay. And then we had HMRC come and see us. And by the time we'd finished the meeting, I just said, look, we're not doing this anymore. Oh, no. Because the onus on staff was too much. Too much, yeah. And I'm like, right, we're just not doing that anymore because I don't I don't think it's fair on staff to, to constantly do these checks and everything else. So we, we don't do it anymore. So in the U.S., it's more sort of cut and dry and ID requirements and sort of the upfront yeah. process. So that can be a significant portion of revenue, sure. yeah. more likely than even event revenue um, and meeting room revenue. So okay. yeah, but I would say offices, yeah, meeting room and mail might be kind of similar. And then folks will, you know, we yeah, we talked about like lots of different opportunities for layering on services, but um, that's that's really interesting. So almost all are now offering private space as well. Would oh, you say? And yes. I mean, I will. Yes. You, I think you could. So you know this because you know the model so well, right? If you're going to run a uh, space with no, you, you can only sell so much non-private space because the person who pays for flex space right, needs to leave their house, but also probably has clients or Zoom yeah. calls. You know, they have, there. there is a segment of folks who are graphic designers or programmers or who can sit at a dedicated desk with a big monitor and they don't need to be on the phone. That's a smaller segment, right? And so if we're trying to fill a space, you've got a few of those in your local, very hyper-local market, but most people who are gonna pay for office space you know, have a serious business or job yeah. or, and they, you know, they need to be on the phone. And so they and need they it. Lock the door. Maybe they need an office or they need, and I will say, cause you just to kind of circle. So yes, private space is like a core offering. If you want to run a really small space, 2000 square feet, and you want to do it all open space, even that's going to be tricky. You're, you won't have enough inventory to pay someone to manage it. So that's really like a not-for-profit break-even. There's some other yeah, reason. That's for really that interesting. Space. Yeah, that's really yeah, interesting. You have to kind of go to scale. But your question was kind of what are operators doing today to be successful? So I'd say more private space. I think the market was going there anyway. I think we had a lot of folks who opened co-working, more open space, and yep. were not doing well not making sort of the income level from an yeah. operating standpoint that they wanted to make. And so there is a sh the challenge though, and you are 
<laughs> you win on this front because you own the asset. The challenge is more private space is more expensive to get into, right? So from an operating business standpoint, you're paying for a build out, which is a huge upfront cost and furniture. It's expensive to kind of get into that business, right? If you don't own the asset and then to sign a five-year lease or even a 10-year lease, but that investment really becomes kind of the landlord's investment. Yeah. But anyway, I think we're seeing a shift to folks are making that investment or buying the building or doing a management agreement. The management agreements are still done more by the bigger players. We're starting to see that happen in smaller markets in the US at least. And then they're doing even more micro private spaces. So I will tour spaces or here. So I run the startup school. I run kind of a mastermind program for operators and I run a mentorship co kind of yeah. coaching program. So I see, you know, lots of floor plans and lots of, you know, P and L's and we see folks who are like, yeah, I had, you know, five phone booths and people came in and wanted the phone booths like as an yeah. office, and for this, <laughs> this micro office because people want private space and they're on the phone, but they don't want to overpay because, you know, sort of gone are the days where I need, big mahogany, you know, I don't need a lot yeah. of furniture and extra space, but I value the private space and I'll pay for that, but I want to overpay for it because I just need the private space. And thank you for all the beautiful, you know, lounge spaces and amenity spaces. So when I want to leave my small office, those are expensive to build, but will sell really quickly. Yeah. The other, um, you know, people are experimenting, right? You mentioned this on the podcast that we did. It's like, it's about understanding what that local market is looking for and what they need. And then kind of, you know, shaping around that, which is hard to do if you've signed a lease, but um, the shared private office, so this office share model folks are doing, you get folks who like, okay, I can be at home a few days a week. I'm not coming to the space, you know, five days a week, but when I come, I want access to an office. So it's sort of taking that membership model even a step further and, and sort of Airbnb being the office, right? Yeah. You can, right, buy bucket of hours. I like those to be recurring so that it's, you know, re recurring revenue makes this model much more yeah. predictable yeah. And, and comfortable. So I'd say more private space, um, smaller private space, and then access to space on demand. Um, I also think I don't, love this from an operator standpoint, but I think it, we used to hold pretty strongly. And again, in the States, kind of the membership model is very prominent. Like, look, it's like a gym. You know, I always say this, it's like a gym. You got to join. You can't, you know, share your membership. You don't get to pause it whenever you want. It's like, you're a member. But I think because people were at home for the better part of a year, maybe, you know, and they they now have a place at home that is that they can manage. Although, again, you pointed out on our podcast, that's not the case for everyone, right? If you're in Manhattan, you have roommates. No, you don't can't be at home. If you live in a you know smaller apartment, you've got kids, you got to get out. So there are people who really need to to leave home, and then there are people like, well, I can I can manage at home. You know, I'm not going to come in every day. And I think people, our end users, have more of a mindset around. Um, paying for what they use versus the membership model, which I don't love as an operator, but I think yeah. <laughs> I think that's what the end user that's, wants. That's really, that's really hard to leverage for getting finance for developing buildings, of course, because it's right. so flaky, right? Yes. <laughs> so you yeah. need that operator buffer. It might be you're, you are the operator, but it's maybe a separate entity and you're trying to create a bit of distance between the two because it can yep. make it quite difficult. What, what would be interesting, I know that some of the questions I get about co-work, some people feel that, or at least they're asking the question of kind of what's the minimum size? Um, I'm looking at a space and to be fair, they're looking more at that open plan space. Can I make this work? And and you mentioned earlier on, you know, there are certain barriers to these things. So for instance, if you need a member of staff, if the, the overall size of the space is 5,000 square foot, divide 5,000 into the wage. If the overall size of space is 100 square foot, it's the same wage. <laughs> it's just a lot more expensive per square foot. I mean, what have you seen as kind of the minimum break? break it's a really difficult question. You know what I'm going to ask you, Jamie. But if somebody's looking at getting started in this industry, yeah. what's the kind of minimum criteria they should be looking at? No, I, I think it's a great question because I try to that's why I run my startup school. I want to, because you know this, 
the design of the business model is really the critical piece, right? How big is the space? What's my product mix? And then who's going to use the space so that I can make all those decisions about product mix and even, you know, finishes and fixtures based on that user so that the user comes in and is like, oh yeah, this is for me. Yeah. So you have to get those things right before you worry about community building and technology and how, you know, how to manage meeting room rentals, like th those operational things people worry a lot about, but it's really the question you just asked, like how big is the space is, is like make or break. And if you're signing a lease, your real estate deal is make or break. So I will yeah. say if you own the asset, you can do a smaller space because you're not, you know, you don't have the rent in the middle, right? So you always have to kind of pro forma, you know, you have to do the pro forma before you, you really know. So on a lease basis, because that's what I'm most familiar with. So you can comment, you have seven locations, you know, the model really well. I tell people typically, again, you can't do all open space anymore unless you do a small space and you don't care if it makes money. Because there are people who want to do flex for, I have a nonprofit and I just need space and I want to share it right there. Or, you know, I run this coaching business and I need places to meet my clients and host events and I might as well make it a co-working space, but it's really just to cover costs, right? So there are, I, I try not to discount any model because there are lots of reasons people will do flex yeah. or, you know, but if you want to um, create income, you know, you want profit from the space and you want someone else to run it, I would say 5,000 square feet is about your minimum yeah. Uh, if you have somebody else running it. Now we have owner operators who will sort of take the job of the community manager. So they're paying themselves, you know, and there's a little profit and they make 70 grand a year. And that's, that's good. Right. So it really depends on your goals. I like, if I'm going to tell somebody to sort of start on a, on a lease basis, I like to start at 8,000 square feet, you know, sort of minimum and go up from there. 8,000 is nice because you can manage it with one staff person. Maybe you've got a little part-time. I mean, you know this because you have a team. Is that gross or net area, Jamie? Is oh, that the overall area? That's right. From a lease perspective, it's what you're paying for on your lease. The actual the right, usable square feet might be a little less. Yeah. yeah right. Okay, yeah. Are, those, are bathrooms included? Is there an elevator that you're working yeah. around? So. Right. So for yeah. me, I, I generally about 10,000 square feet, but it does depend on where you are. So the other piece, maybe to give a bit more context, is if you're a 5,000 square foot space, what would be kind of the target overall income? And again, I know that's such a wide open question, but, it, you know, are we talking about a space that's turning over $150,000? Or are we talking about a space that's turning over half a million, you know, at 5,000 square feet? And I know it depends on location. But I let's know, just I talk a little bit. Let's not talk city center because that's just going to screw us all up <laughs> totally well that's the thing it really depends because i somebody will come at me with a five thousand square foot pro forma and i'll get anxious and they're paying twelve dollars a square foot right yeah. and so it does depend on rent but then if your rent is 12 bucks a square foot your pricing power is lower so maybe from a framework perspective we like to say you should be able to charge per square foot two times market rent which is where being the landlord becomes like a win, 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 right? Because now you're taking kind of all of that. The operator isn't capturing that upside. You're capturing that upside yeah. of two times market rent. And I, you may, it, it, again, it depends on the market, but if you're going to sign a lease, you want to have a price, you want to have pricing power that gets you to two X um, and that people are willing to pay for that, for the flexibility and the fact that it's, you know, furnished and serviced and, and all of that. So that's, that's really interesting. I was, talk I was talking to James, who I'm hoping, um, a, a ch chap I'm hoping to bring on the podcast. He's oper was operating in New York and he said that originally it was that kind of a third, he said, but now it, the rent's almost two thirds. So it's really difficult to make that model right. work there because it's yep. changed so much, but yeah, so there's that magic number. It's a third two thirds. Yeah. Okay. So if you're paying 12, you might be wanting to get 36 pounds a square foot or dollars a square foot, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. That, that fits in with where we're at. I find the 10,000 square foot works for us. And I love 10,000 square feet, by the way, you know, I say eight, cause I feel like I anchor low <laughs> for folks who want to sign a lease. 
you know, taking on 8,000 square feet at, yeah, say it's 20 bucks a square foot. That is a big monthly nut, right? For yeah. somebody who has never operated a space before. Once you get comfortable with that and what the ramp up looks like, and or if you own the building, 100%. And in bigger, like a 10,000 square feet, 15,000 square feet, now you've got more room to like do more offices, but still have some nice open business lounge area or nice meeting rooms. Like you can vary your product mix more with more space. Yeah, for sure. And I, I can't remember, I, um, I have worked it out. I think, I should know this number off the top of my head. I think our net lettable on average, I think was about 77%. I need to I need to check that out and memorize that one. But but we've just worked out roughly, you know, some buildings you've, we've bought and they're not as efficient. Others yeah. have made more efficient. But I think the average is around about 77, 78 percent, something like that. It's so if such you're an important at, point when you're looking at space, though, because if that number is yeah. a lot worse, when you're trying to monetize the square footage, you have to. Yeah, be really you've got to be monetizing that. the net, not the yeah. gross. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, because it can make a huge difference, like you say. So um, I'm conscious we're, we're, we're running out of time. Um, if somebody's getting started in this model right now, what are the things you'd be saying to them? What things did you learn that maybe you would impart on some people um, that were maybe getting started right now, Jamie? Well, I'd say listen to keep listening to Jerry's podcast and think about <laughs> buying the building and then you could, I guess you could listen to mine to figure out how to operate the, the business but start with Jerry's because um, it's such a huge advantage to own the asset I if you can do it and I think there's a big just a, an un, fear of the unknown right for sure it never if I bought my the building I um, leased in Chicago. Oh my goodness. It was in an up and coming area. Google ended up putting its Chicago headquarters a block away. But when I signed the lease, it was still like a meatpacking district. Yep. If I had, th it never occurred to me to buy that building, never occurred to me, but it might've been achievable. And so it just wasn't on my radar screen. Yes. So I think do some research and think about that as the model, because the leasing model for for running this kind of operating business is just harder because it's, you know, it's an arbitrage. You have to get yes. it right. And yeah. so the things that I would say are, are, you know, really relevant to the conversation we've been having, which is that you can, if you want to experiment, you could do sort of an MVP space and figure out the model and get comfortable with it. But then to really, if you have a goal of, of producing operating profit, you need to go with a bigger space. And so, you know, find out how to, you know, figure out how to get yourself comfortable with that and then have the capital to kind of go at that um, and, and get all of those things right, right? The space and the product mix, because that is, you can't fix those things easily, especially if you're signing a lease, yeah. right? Over time, I'm sure in your business, you know, you're evolving in terms of hospitality and amenities and how your team interacts with members and community building. And like all that stuff is a long evolution that you can really play with, but you cannot really fix a bad location or the wrong size of building that doesn't meet your income goals. And everybody's income goals are different. You talked about that in terms of, on, I think on our podcast that we just did, <laughs> in terms of income or sorry, investment, right? Like, Right. Are you looking for cash flow? Or are you looking for, you know, long, longer term sort of buy and hold? So everybody has different, different goals. But if you are looking to, you know, quit your day job and, and, you know, pay the mortgage, you have to go with a bigger space and get that model and that product mix right up front um, and, and have sort of the capital to make those make that investment or find a way to do it, you know, right, get business partners, get by the building to, you know, yeah. get creative about it. But I think that's kind of the big learning is you can figure out things people tend to worry about are actually easier to learn and won't sort of break the model. You need to get the size and the product mix and the who you're serving right and, and start there. And then, you know, lean in. I think it's yeah. right. It's intimidating to lean into size and more offices and more expensive build out. But that's how you get the model to really hum. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic, Jamie. It's been a real, um, really interesting hour we've had here, or more than an hour, discussing stuff on our two different podcasts. I've learned a lot. It's been great. Thank you. Now, I want you just to tell us exactly what your podcast is called. I did mention it in a previous episode, but just to remind people, what's the podcast? I'm assuming it's on all platforms. 
Yeah, it's everywhere you could look for a podcast. It's called Everything Coworking. So everything you need to know to start and run a co-working space. And yeah, that's the kind of the best place to start. Jerry, I will say I have people who start at the very beginning, uh, you know, episode one. That was a long <laughs> time ago. And so much has changed. So I would say yeah. start recent and then go backwards until you feel like, you know, <laughs> yeah. the time will be good. Yeah. <laughs> Leave a review, all that stuff. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for, for hosting me. It's been great to connect. Um, I would love for your listeners to listen to our interview, you sure, know, yeah. because I think it's different perspective. I can't think of the last time I was on a podcast and answering questions. So it kind of puts you <laughs> in different headspace, but it's been a real treat to connect with you. And I'm going to start listening to your podcast uh, about and, my, and my commercial investment. Super. I've learned lots in years already. And I like the fact you interview lots of different people with different models. So, so, and even today you mentioned something just in our discussion right now. And I'm like, ah, I need to think about that. I need to talk to our team about whether we could maybe try doing that. So it's been great. And are you on Instagram as well, Jamie? I mean, I'll put all these things in, in the show notes. You, We can find you all there. Fantastic, right? Yeah, it's every, everything's at Everything Coworking. Website, Instagram, Facebook, all the things. Fantastic. Okay, thanks very much, Jamie. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you.